Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. I'm Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about intuitions versus formulas. I'm going to start with an example that is going to involve you judging music. So I want you to first decide for yourself, how do you judge music? You know, what do you normally do to figure out what is good music or bad music? How do you pick the music that you like? Most people will say that they do it based on sound, you know, how it sounds to them and the things that they like that helps them uh, evaluate the quality. So I'm going to have you listen to five seconds of piano performances in this national junior piano competition. And I want you to try to decide which of these three individuals won the piano competition by listening to the music, <laughs> but only five seconds of of their performances. So the first person will be Avery. Next, we have Parker. And finally, Everett. Okay, what do you think? Avery, Parker, or Everin, who won this piano competition? Now, when I've asked this in classes before, um, what I find is that most people think that Parker won the competition, and they're kind of unsure about who um, might take second and third, either Everin or Avery. But there's a general consensus that Parker probably won the competition just based on the sound. Now I want you to do the same thing, but I want you to look at the visual performance of these young pianists and no sound at all. So again, who do you think is the winner of this competition? Do you got it? Okay, if you are like the people in my previous classes, they would say the individual, the young woman at the top, would most likely be the winner, followed by the uh, young man at the bottom there. Now, if we compare this to the slide before, this these visual clips were actually from the same performances as the audio clips that I showed you. Avery was the person at the top, Everin, the person in the middle, and Parker is the individual at the bottom. So note that when we heard the audio, we made a different choice about who was likely to win the piano competition than when we watched the video. But who actually won the competition? Well, the, the young woman at the top won the competition. And so the reason I'm presenting this uh, type of example to you is this is also what research finds, is that in these large-scale music competitions, that people believe that their judgments about the quality of the music is just based on the sound. However, the findings demonstrate that people actually depend primarily on visual information when making judgments about musical performances, which should be very surprising to you. You think that we, when we're judging music, we should judge music, but what we're actually doing is judging a visual performance, which is what we tended to see here as well. So that's to say with these expert evaluations, experts can be highly biased by things that aren't, uh, that aren't pertaining to the thing that they're evaluating. When judging quality, our intuitions are easily biased by things that do not relate to quality. In a review of 41 studies found that experts change their subjective evaluations 20% of the time. So this is another example of how expert um, evaluations are not entirely reliable. And you might experience this in your daily life, how you might change your evaluation um, by being asked again. So if I were to ask you, would you like water, tea, coffee, or Pepsi, you might say, I don't know, tea or something. But then if I was to ask you, are you sure? You might change your mind. <laughs> so that's to say that when we're asked to make the same evaluation more than once, often we can change our mind by just kind of reevaluating it a little bit. And this is what we find with expert evaluations as well. When they're asked to repeat the same judgment 20% of the time, they're changing their mind. 
So unreliable judgments cannot be valid predictors of anything. And here is one of my kind of favorite examples of the unreliability of our subjective intuitions, which is a study where they find that the order that American Idol um, participants or contestants appear on the show is highly related to their success. So if you appear later on in the show, you're more likely to win the competition. And the reason for that is that we tend to have more positive feelings towards things that are easy to remember. So if there's a contestant that, um, you know, performed right before you have to make your final decision, their performance will be easier to remember and you will think it is better. And this is what you see with American Idol performances. This is also what you see in job interviews. So if you have an option when you are going to be a, a interviewee, um, in terms of what order you're interviewed, try to be interviewed last. Because that will most likely get you the job because the person that someone interviewed last will be easiest for them to remember and they will have the most positive associations with that person. And this is no joke, I have tried this, it absolutely works. The subjective judgments, even from experts, are influenced by many things like the order of presentation or if the question is asked again. So what can we do? One debiasing approach is to use formulas instead of intuitions. And what I mean by formulas is try to make the decision less subjective if possible. And you can do that by kind of making mathematical calculations rather than using your intuition about a, a situation. For example, in a review that looked at 20 studies that compared clinical prediction of patients versus statistical predictions, they found that the formulas were more accurate than 11 out of the 14 counselors, suggesting that these types of formulas can be very, very effective and much more effective than um, subjective evaluations, even from experts. Some work finds that about 60% of studies have shown significantly better accuracy for algorithms versus subjective expert evaluations. Here's another really fantastic study where they looked at how to statistically predict wine sales over time. And they have expert evaluations. There's individuals who are paid lots of money and their entire job is to evaluate wine. And what they did instead was to create a formula that included the average temperature, the amount of rain at harvest, and the total rain during the previous year. And they were more able to accurately predict the sales of these wines in future years than very far into the future as well, which is really, really impressive. The formula forecasted future prices much more accurately than current prices or any of the experts. And this really created a big controversy because, you know, people get paid to make these predictions, but their predictions are biased by lots of things, not just what we've talked about in this lecture today. So if you can take a valuation that is subjective and make it more mathematical like this, looking at even just three simple things, you're more likely to make a more effective decision that is less biased by these kind of subjective um, influencers that we've been talking about. Now, would you actually use an algorithm? What types of decisions might be great for an algorithm? Well, any time that you're making a big decision in your life, I think it's the time to try to employ an algorithm. Here's an example. Um, if you're hiring someone, this is what you could do. So you could select six important traits for the candidate that you're hiring. Maybe it's technical proficiency, maybe it's personality, reliability, you know, whatever it is that is important for this job. And then you would make a list of questions for each of the traits and a scoring system possibly one through five. And then essentially you just add up the scores. And when you're interviewing someone, you can actually mark them on the scale in terms of how technically proficient are they, one through five. How much does their personality align with your group, one through five. How reliable are they, one through five. And then you add up the scores and you use that number to decide between different candidates rather than your subjective interpretation. Because the truth is, is that there's so many 
subjective biases that are unrelated to performance. In a job standpoint, we tend to like people who look like us. We tend to like people who are of our same group. That doesn't mean that they have a better ability to do the job. We just tend to like them. And because we feel good about them, we like them personally, we will think that they could do a better job. And those two things are unrelated. Um, so when we have a positive feeling towards someone, we might accidentally um, also believe that they will have a positive work outcome, which is not the case. Those two things are not correlated. Okay, so summary here, subjective judgments, even from experts, are influenced by many things, like the order of presentation or if the question was asked again. And big de-biasing technique you could use is to create a formula instead of using intuitions. I showed you a very simple example where you can create a scale and just kind of add up the values on the scale. You can really do that for almost any type of judgment. So if you're hiring someone, if you're applying for a school, if you're buying a house, even if you're evaluating a partner, you know, this is one technique you can use to help yourself make less of a biased decision. And formulas are generally more accurate, but people don't like them. They have an uncomfortable feeling about using a formula to pick your partner, right? Doesn't that feel kind of weird? Um, but they tend to produce more effective judgments because they are less biased by all the things we've talked about in this class. Mm -hmm.